Please welcome Rule Kanga Michael Hall. Thank you very much, Karen. And uh, welcome everybody to the Auckland Art Gallery. And uh, thanks very much for coming. So this is my uh, uh, design encounter about the influence of uh, California as it uh, relates to circles. And um, I'm very pleased to be here talking about it because right from uh, my first um, mad thought that I had about making circles way back when I was a kid, I was very influenced by what I saw in California. So it's great to be able to talk to you all hear about it now. Um, I, uh, I built my, my circles in a, in a factory up in Rotaka, I've been doing, doing that since 1983. But when I was a kid and you know, I wanted to make a surfboard, I didn't have the flash factory with all the, all the gadgets and, and all the gear and everything, I was just a kid. And I had a bedroom. So, yes I did. I made my, uh, my samples in my bedroom and I don't know how my mother uh, put up with me. She was very supportive. If you can imagine the dust and the fumes that were coming out of my, my bedroom back in 1971. Um, and she just somehow turned a blind eye and uh, looked up and up and up back to cheese scones. The other thing I'd, I'd like to mention is um, I've got uh, my work colleagues here that I've worked with um, that, have, that have helped me build all of these surfboards. Um, I do have a couple of historic boards with me, these two over here from the 70s and the 80s that Colin and I bought. But when I finish my talk and we're having a look at all the boards, um, I, I have my, my work colleagues here and uh, make me feel very good to have them here. Chris Glass, my office administrator, is here somewhere. And, um, where are you, Chris? Probably a little bit shy, but she's here somewhere. And uh, she has to put up with my mess these days, and she's the one that's more likely to look up at the strong. I also have um, Emma Cox is here, and hopefully Jay, Jay Rookaway is here. But the thing about those two is that they are circle craftsmen. Um, I don't want to say craftswoman in, in Emma's case. Um, because I think the word craftsman tells us all a, a little bit about what it is they do. So have a good look at the boards while you're here and, um, and just check it out and, and, and have a look at the work that goes into them. They are handmade and uh, individually made and they're custom made. Talking about California, you can't really get to California without stopping in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii is, as far as we're concerned, the birthplace of surfing. And the Hawaiians really enjoyed it. They all did it. Um, it was something that evolved over the centuries and it became a massive part of their culture. It was very sophisticated. Um, they learned how to make surfboards from the raw materials they had which were trees and they learned how to use the curves that were in the trees naturally and how to remove you know, the curves from the parts of the tree that they didn't need. They, they learned how to, how to make circles and function in the waves. So they developed their circle shapes to a very high level. Now, when, um, when Europeans came to Hawaii, this is the sort of thing they saw. And I don't think that's a cliche, I think that's what they saw. They saw everybody in the water having fun riding waves on different lengths and different types of circles, riding different styles. Um, unfortunately, when the missionaries came along, the, um, the missionaries wore a lot of clothes the Hawaiians were wearing, and um, things had to change. And surfing was frowned upon, um, it was discouraged, and it pretty much all, all but disappeared. And with it, a um, massive knowledge base on how to design and shape circles disappeared as well. It wasn't until the turn of the century when um, Hawaii started to become a, started to become developed for tourism, it seemed like a good idea to promote surfing again. 
and that's where California comes into it. Um, the way the surfing got to California is that three Hawaiian princes were sent to Santa Cruz to go to school to get an education. And these guys, they, these guys um, missed their surfing, so they built themselves some boards and they started surfing in California. So that's how surfing actually got to California. California embraced surfing, and it's interesting that when the Californians started to make surfboards, they didn't make them out of trees as such. They went to the sawmill and brought a flat plank of timber and went surfing on it. So, if you can imagine, uh, modern surfboards kind of came from a different viewpoint, and the curves that the Hawaiians knew all about had to kind of like be redeveloped. And, and, and they, it took a long time for those curves to come back into surfboards. So we really lost a lot through the disappearance of, of surfing in Hawaii. By the time um, we got into the 50s, we had guys like Greg Nolan here. And um, that, that surfboard, that's the surfboard that's actually in the exhibition. Um, you'll see that board there. It was made by Greg Nolan. And Greg was the pioneer of big wave surfing. He was the pioneer of making surfing movies. And he was the pioneer of the surfboard industry. So by the time we get into the 50s and the 60s in California, there was really a, a, a big um, manufacturing base in California. The Californians had kind of like evolved the methods and the materials to make surfboards. They figured it all out. And um, they started using redwood, and then um, with, um, with Hollywood, um, the use of balsam would became available because they used balsam a lot in the, in the props for Hollywood, Hollywood movies. So the surfboard builders started um, using balsam wood, and then um, at the end of the Second World War, a lot of those uh, secret materials that had been developed during the war became declassified and filtered down into industry. And surfboard makers had access to polyurethane foams and fiberglass. So the California surfboard industry worked out all the processes and how to use those materials. And kind of around about 1958 is when they started to uh, phase out balsa wood and go to the, to the, to the, um, the foams and the, the fiberglass. These are some of the iconic labels that came up in California, and many of those businesses are still operating today. So the way that we make samples in Ruanaka, and the way that samples are made all around the world pretty much, um, the, the, method, the materials and the methods pretty much came from that, that um, California surf industry. By the time we get to the end of our design period, which the exhibition that, um, that we're showing goes from 1930 to 1965. By the time we get to 1965, surfing in California had evolved into a very slick, state-of-the-art kind of thing with it, that the surfboards were um, very well crafted. And the pinnacle of surfing in 1965 in California uh, was nose riding. And that's David Weaver, who was the uh, number one nose rider at the time, showing you know, some style and flair and executing a uh, very difficult nose ride in a critical part of the way. Now, that's all very well, but something funny was happening in the background. And what that was, that a, uh, a, a California surfer from Santa Barbara by the name of George Brito he was an, actually a kneeboarder. He decided that it was getting a little bit crowded in California, so he decided to move to Australia. He heard about all these empty waves over there. So in 1964, George Greeno moves to Australia, and he's riding this tiny little kneeboard, and he's ripping all over the waves, surfing like nobody in Australia has ever seen. Well, the Aussies couldn't believe it, and they all wanted to surf like George. So they started looking at George's equipment, and they noticed that he had these, you know, highly evolved foil detectable fins, and he was going um, to places on the waves that they could only dream about. So, George, by George moving to Australia, he 
he basically kick-started, without, without meaning to, he kick-started what was become known as the shoreboard revolution. And the, the reason that this is interesting to me is that by the year 1966, the shoreboard revolution had, had, had gained so much momentum in Australia that the Aussies were on a totally different wavelength with their surfboards and their surfing to what was happening in the art in California. So in 1966, when the Californians hosted the World Championships in San Diego, and the Aussies turned up, David Uliva was surfing like that in the contest, and the Aussies, um, being headed by Nat Young, were riding these much shorter, much more maneuverable boards, and they weren't worrying about nose riding, they were worrying about being stylish, they were being aggressive, and they were trying to position themselves in the most critical part of the way, and they were doing radical maneuvers. And the Aussies won, won the event, and the world shift of power, if you like, uh, as far as surfing goes, moved to Australia. And it's stayed there for many, many years. So, it's, it, there's a lot of kind of ironies in it. Um, uh, because of the shortboard revolution, longboarding was kind of like, it, it actually went completely out of style. And the longboards disappeared, and shortboards got shorter, surfboards got shorter and shorter and shorter. And riding a longboard was no longer cool. So, um, by the time I got into surfing, if you rode a longboard, you were called a coot. And so not many people did. And the only place you'd really see longboards were like on the back yard of the surf club, you know. And, um, but at the beach where I, where I live, we got lots of little waves. And, um, and we kind of, you know, we didn't, we didn't know we were uncool, we didn't know we were coots. We just knew it was lots of fun riding the old longboards, and that's what we did. And I had a bit of a dream about, um, you know, making a new one, like making a, a modern longboard. Like, hey, that'd be cool, we could make it light, and we could do this, and we could do that, and play around with the shapes. I didn't really do anything about it until I went on a trip to Hawaii, and I saw a guy called Ben Iper. And Ben Iper was doing exactly that. One day he'd be out on a shoreboard, and he'd be surfing like the Aussies, showed everybody how to do. The next day he'd be out on a longboard, and he'd hang his head. And I thought, wow, that's just awesome. This guy does it both. You know, that's got to be the way to go. I mean, why be, why be stuck in one track? So, I cut my world trip short, not as far as I want. And um, headed back to New Zealand and ripped the glass off a of board and made himself a longboard. Um, and it was a very um, unwelcome thing to do as far as uh, New Zealand was concerned at the time. People weren't kind of ready for that, they tried to put step backwards. So it, was, it, it kind of came with mixed emotions because I thought it was a fantastic thing to do and I had a lot of fun doing it. But people couldn't get their head around it. Anyway, slowly but surely around the world, um, long, long was did come back because people kind of miss that sort of thing and there are days when the long board is the best board to have. So it's very common to go to the beach now and see long boards everywhere. And what's interesting about it is that influence from California is still there because people that ride long boards, they like to ride the nose. They like to ride the nose just like the Californians, you know, showed us how to do in the mid-60s. And the aggressive Australian shortboarding approach has been worked into the longboard scenario as well. So now the longboard does both. So it's, it's kind of cool how it's evolved. A major influence from California, and strictly speaking, this is a little bit outside of our design here, but it's so important, I've got to mention it, because in the, in, the, in the late 60s, there was a, another knee border in California, uh, from, this time from San Diego, by the name of Steve List. And he had very short little knee boards with split tails, and he had two little fins on them. And they were called fish. And these boards are so different from what everybody else was riding. Um, you couldn't help but notice, and the surfing was different. It was very fast and very spontaneous. It's slowly from um, sort of a little local scene in San Diego 
the, the fish, the effect of the fish went like a ripple. And it traveled up and down the California coast, it traveled to Florida, and it slowly traveled around the world. And I got kind of bitten by the fish bug. Um, there's one of my fishes from the 70s over there that you can have a look at later on. The fish had a big influence at the time um, on, on, on surfing. And um, when, when, I, when, I went, um, when I went surfing, when I went on that trip that I told you about, when I went you know, to Hawaii, the board that I, that I took to make was fish. So I thought, well, fish would be the best board to take traveling. So I made myself a fish, very similar to the one over there. And unfortunately in Hawaii, I broke it into three pieces one day. So there I was without a board. So what did I do? I went, I got, I went and got myself a blank and um, I smuggled it past reception. I was staying in a high rise behind the key on the left floor and uh, I got this blank up in the elevator. And there I was again in my bedroom with this blank making a surfboard. So I made it board there, I had to hold it on the end of the bed with one hand and just kind of like shake it with the other hand and spin it around. And, uh, I don't know how I came up that mess either. Now, um, the, the influence of the fish is such that all these years later, people get together and they talk about fishes and they celebrate fishes. They're just such fantastic little surfboards that these events have sprung up around the world called fish fries. And the fish fries is a day when people just turn up at the local beach, they bring along their fish surfboard, and they all just get around and talk about them. It's not a competition, it's just a get together. And the fish fry is, is, is a worldwide phenomenon now, um, such as is the reverence of, of these surfboards. And I just want to mention that we have photographer Michael Cunningham here today. Where are you, Mike? Mike's over the back there. You might want to have a chat with Mike because Mike is hosting um, the first New Zealand Fish Fry. It's an international event and it's going to be held at Waipu Cove this summer. So have a talk to Mike about that because it's going to be a really neat thing to come along. It'll be a celebration of all the surfboards that we're talking about today and you'll see all that California influence. Now, the other way that the fish influence things is it kind of turned people onto the idea of surfing shorter, wider, thicker boards with two fins. And back to the Australians, Mark Richards saw what was happening with the fishes, and he was like, you know, one of the one of the leading pro surfers of the day. And he needed a board that, would, that he could adapt to competition surfing. So he took the concept of the fish and he came up with what we call a twin fin. It was a very modern version, very high performance version of the fish. Um, Mark Richards won four consecutive world championships riding a twin fin. The whole surfing world changed overnight from riding single fins to riding twin fins. Again, the result of this early Californian fish influence. Now, at the end there, what that started was another revolution. It started the multi-fin revolution. And surfboards have gone on to, to, you know, to go from single fins to twin fins to three fins. And currently now, there's a really big movement around four fin surfboards. There, uh, on the screen here's a couple of um, modern versions of uh, fishes and twin fins that we've made. And uh, you'll see some boards here. This one over here is, a, is, is kind of like a, a fish from the 70s, if you like. It's made out of coconut wood, which um, was all just driftwood that washed up on my local beach during one big winter storm. And um, the thing with making a fish out of wood, the wood just seems to give the whole feel of the board another, another dimension. It just, uh, it just gives a fantastic ride. In California, at different times of history, there's been different characters that have done different things. In the 1940s, there was a guy called Bob Simmons, and he was, he was in the same part of town as Steve Liss, about 20 years earlier. 
And Bob was a eccentric kind of a guy. He was a bit of a loner, he did things his way. He was a mathematician, and he worked all the circles out using mathematical, mathematical equations. How many other shapers did that? And they used to have fierce arguments about what was right and what was wrong. But Bob just did it his way. And Bob was responsible for coming up with a lot of the foils and a lot of the, the rail shapes, the way the curves were put together and concave bottoms. And he was the originator of, of the idea of using two pins. So Bob had this massive influence whereby, even though the other shapers in California that were doing great things didn't agree with him and they didn't copy his boards, they took a lot of the design elements out of his boards and integrated them into what they did. So he had an effect that changed all circles. Something else that Bob Simmons did is being a bit of a loner, he'd nip off for a surf by himself. And we all, all surfers know what that's like. Um, and he had a little short break way that he used to go and surf all by himself. Nobody else was interested. And he didn't want to ride his 10 foot bob board there because it wasn't the right, it didn't suit the wave conditions. So he made a 6 foot version of a 10 foot board. Everybody was riding 10 foot boards except for Bob. He had a little 6 foot board. Now, the world didn't really know too much about this. Bob died and life went on and things you know, did, did what they did. But there was always this kind of rumour floating around about this board that might have been and nobody was too sure. And about 10 years ago, a guy called John Elwell who was a friend of uh, Bob Simmons said, yes, yes, that board did exist, and yes, it looked like this. And he got together with uh, some of the Californian shapers and they recreated it. And they came up with what's called the Mini Simmons. And this is the Mini Simmons here. Very short, very wide, um, very flat, got two fins. On the screen um, we've got some um, Mini Simmons that we've made, the one on the, on the left's got wooden rails, you can look at that wooden board feel, and the other one's done with a resin tint, which is one of the processes that was developed in, in that early California surf industry has become very popular again now. Another influence from California from very, very, very early on, and I did mention George Greeno before and how he went to California and changed, uh, how he went to Australia and changed everything. The other thing that he was doing was he wasn't just riding short knee boards, he was riding flexible knee boards. He was working on watching fish and he figured out that you know, a surfboard should be moving like fish moves, it should be changing shape. And his fins were modelled after tuna fins. And he had the right idea. Um, and there are a few people that have played with flex as a result of meeting with George over the years and, and, and seeing what he was doing on his boards. And one of them is an Australian called Mitchell Ray. And Mitchell's been making boards with flexible tails, you know, right through from the 60s when he first met George to the present day. He's got it very, very um, evolved. And what it, what it does is it gives your surfboard basically a muscle so that as you wake your back foot to go into a turn, the flexible tail contorts, changes shape, and it allows you to go around corners tighter. And then when you come out of the turn, the reflex, the memory of the material the tail's made out of, wants to return to its normal shape so it snaps back into shape and propels the circle forward. So you get this circle that's got a, a kind of a, a, a muscle or a life of its own. And um, we've made around with it over the years and made a few boards and I've had three of them myself and it really does work. It's just very hard to manufacture. So it's something that hasn't really caught on in a, in a big way, but my, my sort of gut feeling on flex is that one day the future of circles will be um, they, they will all have flexible tails and hopefully interchangeable tails so you, you can take one tail off you know, for a certain type of surgery you might want a tail that's more flexible or less flexible so surfers these days they change fins they, they put different shaped fins or more flexible or less flexible fins I think one day in the future surfers will have tails that are flexible and can change 
That's just to show you um, a board that we were making. That's the knee board, and um, you can see where my hand is there that the, the bones get very, very thin there. As we shape the board, we, re we remove all the bone from the tail, and it just ended up a solid fiberglass tail. It's flexible. Let's go back to the 1930s. Let's go right back to the start of our design period. California started to move to Hawaii to go surfing. They heard about the waves and they, and they wanted to go surfing in, in those waves. They took with them the flat planks that they'd made you know, out, of, out of the sawmill timber that had very little contour in it. And they had trouble. Um, as the surfing evolved, they had trouble getting those flat planks to, to ride in the, in, the, in the steeper pocketing waves that Hawaii had. Waves that are breaking on reefs, they are in the hollow, and they'll ride them off really quickly, and they'll stand up and try and get into these waves with their big flat circles to slide sideways. So, this guy, John Kelly, and, and some of his friends, they got sick of it one day, they were like to get surfers around, and they wanted to go surfing waves, and they were struggling because the boards went up to it. So, they had a meeting on the beach, and they went right. They got out their axes and their draw knives, and they basically shaved the tail of these surfboards down, very narrow and very curved. And what they've done, I don't know if they realised it or not, but what they've done is they've tapped into to that design knowledge that the ancient Hawaiians have been using. And they put the curves back into the board in the right places. When they fell back out, took off on those thick waves, the boards just hung up and placed the way and stayed there, and all of a sudden they could shoot forward and ride along the way. These boards are called hot curls because they could ride in the hot curl of the waves, so they called them hot curl. Now, what the hot curl did is it meant that all of a sudden the surfers could start riding more challenging waves, bigger waves. So these boards were the start of the big wave surfing movement. They also freed the surfer up, so the surfer didn't have to stand on the tail, trying to control the board, dropping a foot in the water to steer. All of a sudden, the surfer could move forward on the board and start doing other stuff. So, the hot curl also was the start of what was called the hot curl movement. The hot, the, sorry, the hot dog movement. The hot dog style of surfing, where the surfer basically makes up his own repertoire of what he's going to do. So, all of a sudden, you had surfers that were once just stuck on the back of their board, just you know, trying to hang on to their life. All of a sudden, you can start getting flamboyant and you can start doing different things. The hot curl was only around for a little while, about 10 years, because as things evolve, you know, they do, somebody put a fin on a surfboard. I've got a guy uh, called Tom Lake out of California. He, he unbolted a, an aluminium skeg off a water ski and he bolted it onto a surfboard, and all of a sudden, he had control and maneuverability. And there's three boards in that photo there, two of them are hot curls, no fin, and George Downing standing in with his board and he's got a fin on it. So you can see in that photo that things were changing. And what happened over a period of about 10 years, the hot curls got phased out, and surfboards with fins have basically been the, the, the main way of doing it. Um, it's, it's interesting, with the long boards having come back over the years, there's been a big sort of uh, renaissance in um, in, in surfboard design and, and um, craftsmanship and uh, a lot of the old stuff, there's been a lot of, um, a, lot of a lot of people who used to surf, a lot of nostalgia, thinking about it all and let's do this, let's do that. And people you know, look at boards like that and that sort of thing. And so what's happened is uh, shapers around the world um, have started going to places like the Bishop Museum in Hawaii and looking at the old boards. There's a few old boards here. The old Hawaiian board and discovering the, the curves and the shapes and how to good look. And well, none of those boards have fins. So they started to you know, make reproductions. And out of it has come this whole phenomena of riding finless surfboards. And it's seeping the world. There's a few different um, variations on it. But a California called Tom Wegener kind of kick started the thing off. And I was very intrigued because I'm a surfboard shaper, so it's kind of like, well, all of a sudden people are riding surfboards, they don't have any fins on them. How can they do that? So I had to get my head around it, and I wanted to be involved, 
And I thought, well, hey, what about those popular boards that they used to write in the 1930s? So I thought I'd have a go at making one and, and see what it was like to surf it. Here's the, here's the modern day one here. And you can see that it's got the same sort of roll V shape that, that the guys uh, came up with in the, in the 1930s. And you'll notice that I've got quite a collection of them there. And I've, I've kind of uh, evolved the thing to the point where I've taken the, the 1930s concepts and I've merged it with a lot of ideas and, and just sort of tried to bring that 1930s style of serving into the present day. And it, it, it really is a lot of fun taking off on a wave without a fin and, and it's a completely different feeling, it's a completely different sensation and who knows where we'll go with it. But um, there's, there's, a, there's a nice collection of hot curls over there of different lengths that, uh, that you can have a look at. So I'm going to be, uh, that's the end of my talk, I'm going to be hanging around for a while. Um, so feel free to uh, come and ask me any questions. Um, feel free to, to browse around and have a look at the board. Thank you very much for coming.